It works. Okay. All right. Can we look so, now? Okay. What? Can we look? Can we look now? Yeah, you can look. <laughs> it's ready now. Okay. So okay. good morning. Um, my topic is cultural awareness and sensitivity. So I'm going to start with a little background. My name is Mathieu Melissa Lim, and I was born and raised in the Philippines. I was born to Charles Lim and Lulu Lim. My dad's a telecommunications executive at PLDT. My mom is a BSF leader, so Bible study group leader. And I lived in Hong Kong for the first two years of my life because my dad, at the time, was working with Coca-Cola and got transferred there. But I came back after two years, and I've been living here ever since. And a big part of my life was studying in Beacon International School, where I studied throughout my entire elementary and my middle school years. And then in ninth grade, I came to Faith Academy. So I'm actually relatively new here. New here. I've been here for like only four years. So, I mean, in that time, I've seen Faith actually change a lot. And that's something I'm going to be talking about throughout my presentation. But so that's just a little background about me. Okay, um, well, uh, my family really likes to travel a lot. Uh, we do this every year or so. Um, we either go to a new country or we go to the U.S. to visit family. My family really likes to go out um, to travel because my parents really believe in um, helping us get out into the world and understanding cultures outside of our own. And um, we do it also to bond and have fun together. And so I've been to a few places around the world. and. Yeah, that makes me, um, I'm not like very well traveled, but I mean, for somebody who isn't like a missionary, I've, I've actually been around the world quite a bit, so yeah. All right, and my spiritual journey. So uh, I grew up in a Christian home. My parents were Christian when they met each other and they raised their family in a Christian home. But I felt like my faith was only really starting to grow when I moved to Faith Academy. And I think a lot of that has to do with the environment, like the learning environment, and also the friends that I made. And it was really interesting because um, I was really involved in church when I was in middle school. I started doing ministry with the children's, yeah, with the children's ministry. And I've been teaching um, Bible um, Sunday school and daily vacation Bible school. I started doing that when I was 13. And so... Um, like I thought my faith was okay then, but I moved to Faith Academy and then I realized that there was so much more to learn about um, growing in Christ and, and growing in my um, spiritual relationship with Him. And so, yeah, I just did a whole bunch of things that I never thought I'd be doing. Like we do ministries at Faith. I love that. Um, outdoor Ed was really fun for me. That was like when I first got to do my praise and worship. And we did ministry outreach with Mrs. Stradless. So, I mean, that was like really fantastic for me. And so, yeah, Faith Academy has been a huge part in my spiritual growth. Yeah. Okay. And so how my life intersects with this issue. Um, over there um, is a picture of me with my faith friends and then my beacon friends who are all Filipino. And then I went to Brown University over the summer and so I spent like three weeks there meeting a ton of new people. I, the only other person who's Filipino was Gia. So I basically spent time with people from Europe, from um, South America, from other parts of Asia, from United States. So I just met a ton of new people. Those are my best friends and they were all different um, nationalities. And so it's kind of crazy like how often you get to come across different people. And so um, I just like this quote. We could learn a lot from crayons. Some are sharp, some are pretty, and some are dull. Some have weird names, but all are different colors. Uh, but they all fit nicely into the same box. So I feel that my life really intersects with this issue because I come across so many different people and I love talking to people, I love working with people, I like teaching people and um, someday I want to be a teacher slash counselor and if God wills it, you know, I'll pursue a career there in that direction and I feel that my, li like, my life really intersects with this issue in that way because it's important for wherever you go to always develop a sensitivity and awareness of what's going on around you. Like not even just knowing um, where a country is or like the kinds of foods that they make but you know like the people and how they interact with one another and the kind of um, practices that you should be um, uh, doing there in that country I suppose. Yeah so um, my time at Brown especially was a really big uh, development in my um, cultural awareness growth because I had to learn a lot of things like what to say, what not to say, what was appropriate, what wasn't appropriate because I mean I grew up in the Philippines. I mean 
even American culture here is different from American culture in the U.S., right? So um, it was a lot of adjustment for me. Beacon to Faith Academy was an adjustment. Faith Academy to the U.S. was an adjustment. It's just a constant, like, change. And you think you get a hang of it, but, you know, there's always so much more to learn. And so I think that's really important. Uh, all right, so cultural awareness. So cultural awareness, um, by um, this definition, I got this from a site called culturaldiversity.com, which is um, a site set up for people who are struggling with um, migrating to different countries and figuring out how they can integrate well into the society by being more culturally aware and sensitive to other people. Um, the site gave me this really great definition, which is, um, how cultural awareness entails an understanding of how a person's culture may inform their values, behavior, beliefs, and basic assumptions. And so that's how it's defined. All right, so um, why I believe it's a global issue. So I personally experienced it, but I had to do a little more research to see how it was a relevant problem in um, society. And so um, I came across this really interesting study about uh, Chinese communities in the UK. So in the 1900s, um, Chinese communities uh, first began appearing um, when they were migrating from Shanghai to uh, Liverpool on um, trade ships, I believe. And now 5% of the ethnic minority population in Britain is made up of these Chinese communities. And it's really interesting because studies show that of all the ethnic minorities in the UK right now, the Chinese community is one of the most well integrated into society. However, despite all of this, they still face a lot of stigma, language barriers, and a lack of support and serv um, and services on a daily basis. And so much, like it's so overlooked that um, they have to do more research now on the mental health of the Chinese communities because they didn't realize that they were facing all of these problems and all of those problems in the Chinese community have started to um, um, become real problems like in the workplace, how they treat other people, how they um, how they interact with um, British, the British people there. And the reason why this happened is because um, they stayed in very tight-knit communities where they practice their own tradition, which is good because preserving a culture even when you're in another country is very important. But it became so exclusive, exclusive to the point that um, um, British interaction with Chinese communities became very limited and um, it was both the faults I believe of the host country the UK as well as the Chinese community because the Chinese community community could have done better to integrate themselves into society and to um, open up their community and um, right but also the host country the UK could also work on some sensitivity issues about meeting the uh, health needs of the Chinese community as what they're doing now, that's what they're trying to do now. They're trying to give them better health benefits, trying to give them better work benefits in order to compensate for all of the stress that the Chinese communities are feeling from the British. And so I think like that's um, just like, it, it's like a magnification of what's happening in faith too, because I feel like that also happens at faith sometimes that we have so many different cultures coming in, and so they try to um, preserve their culture by staying in little groups, but that's why we had to have the no English rule, because there were some cultures that were um, keeping too much to themselves and creating barriers between other cultures. So um, not only is it just a problem here, but it happens to be a problem on like a global scale. And so why is it important for me to be telling everybody else about cultural awareness and sensitivity? Well, it's important because stereotypes and prejudices can be formed. There's always the danger of a single story. Um, a couple of weeks ago, actually like maybe two months ago, um, there was a tweet that came out and it was by this woman and it says, Muslims view Islamic terrorists the same way most Christians view the Westboro Baptist Church. And this tweet got went viral, a lot of um, comments have been made on it, news articles, I read up on some of them, and it became really controversial. And to me, like the first time I ever read that, I was just shocked. I mean, I know it's a very black and white um, statement, and I know that it's not, um, like it shouldn't be taken so literally, but I mean, just the fact that, 
like it was true like even if i'm aware of cultural awareness and sensitivity that sometimes when things happen like the boston bombing or when things happen like 9 11 like you know all these thoughts go through your head about muslims and you stereotype them and i unknowingly did that despite how i'm supposed to be educated and i grew up in um a racial diverse a racially diverse community like it still happens and so this kind of like put me back in my place i was like you know um if most if most people um, non-christians viewed us christians the same way they viewed the westboro baptist church wow that's that's really that would be awful and the same way it would be awful for me to assume that you know all muslims act like terrorists which they really don't so i mean that was just an eye-opener for me and um i have this comic about ignorance and it's um i i put it up there because i just wanted to put out the fact that i know ignorance has a lot to do with the cultural awareness and sensitivity issue but I don't think that it's an excuse that someone can carry around with their whole life. I mean, it gets tiring after a while. Um, so just like a personal story, I went to Vancouver about six years ago, and I was maybe fourth, fifth grade, and we went up to this mountain called Whistler. It's a beautiful mountain, and we were hiking, and there was this French uh, couple that had gotten lost and they were asking for directions and they were really surprised that we could speak English and she like had personally asked me if I went to school and if I lived like in a tree in a house in a tree and I was like well first of all I wouldn't be speaking English if you know uh, I like was living in a house in a tree in the jungle with no school and second of all I mean I'm in Vancouver I'm in Whistler it's I mean like I don't know I just to me, like the ignorance, I guess I could have excused it at the time, and I did because I was like, oh, well, I, mean, I guess she doesn't know much about the Philippines. No one really knows about the Philippines, but I mean, it just kept happening. Like when I was at Brown University last summer, this girl, I mean, you think that it's an Ivy League university, so all these people are really educated and they're really um, well aware and they're sensitive, but this girl, she was my age, and she walked up to me and she was like, you live in the Philippines, so do you live in like a tribe? Like I wouldn't be here if I lived in a tribe, you know? I just, I feel that, um, while sometimes yes we can accept ignorance and try to help it like you can't just well no you can't accept ignorance but i mean you um it can't be used as an excuse sometimes it you can let it go and say hey you know just try to be more sensitive next time but you can't just keep doing that you can't just go around making insensitive remarks especially when you don't know anything about the country i mean maybe if she had like looked it up on google first you know to find out about the philippines and like how it's actually a very well developed country and that we have like one of the seventh largest city in the world that she would have never asked that question but because things like that happen ignorance leads to insensitivity leads to unawareness and so i think it's a problem it causes tension between people i didn't really like the girl and i know that that was mean right but i felt like i didn't want to talk to her the rest of the camp even if she was a great person we ended up becoming friends and laughing about it but i mean in that instant i was like i don't want to talk to somebody who is you know that rash in their judgment i guess so why is it a spiritual issue? Um, okay. Hold on. Okay. So God commanded us to love, which is in First John four twenty one. He died for everyone's sins, which also means we are all equal. So no one is no more or no less. So we should do our best to respect one another, which is um, Romans five eight. And we shouldn't judge one another because we're all going to have our own judgment. And so, again, it goes back to we can't judge each other by culture or by practice or by race because we're all going to have our own judgment in time. So, yeah. And Christian involvement. Um, how Christians can be responsible um, in their actions and their behaviors. I think this is really important because... Um, it's the responsibility of every Christian to be a light of God unto others. That's how we spread God's love, I feel, in the best way. Um, just those who especially aren't like necessarily open to, um, I guess, religious influence, let's say. Like at Brown, um, I couldn't necessarily evangelize to my friends, like bring out a Bible and tell them, but they could tell that there's something different about me because of the way I spoke and the way that um, I behaved in front of other people, 
the ideas that I had and so on. So I think that it's every person's responsibility to be a light of God unto others. And so when you're being insensitive and unaware and offensive to people of different cultures who don't understand you, that's not showing God's love. That's just pushing them away from you and then maybe ultimately pushing them away from Christians, right? Because that can happen sometimes. And so yeah, I guess the importance is emphasized on reflecting God's love in everything you do. And um, I guess you could do that by being more aware of who you're talking to, the things that you say to them, and the things that you can learn. Be open-minded. Um, yeah. And be, like, you can be a teacher, but also be a teachable person. I think that's really important as well. Because when you are closed-minded, people don't really want to talk to you, or people don't, aren't open up for discussion. But when you um, open up your mind and when you accept if, that there are different possibilities to something, then people will be more willing to talk to you and then you can work out those um, awareness issues and sensitivity issues that way. All right, so this is now focused on me and how I can deal with it in my community. Uh, in order to get a better look into the racial sensitivity, um, cultural sensitivity and awareness issue at Faith Academy, I did a survey. I did a personal survey, like I had to interview seven staff members face to face. Um, and then I also sent a Google form, a poll out to 10 students, or oh, to multiple students, but 10 replied to me. And I just asked a couple of questions about um, evidence of a cultural awareness sensitivity issue. How do you think um, it can be helped? Is there any personal experience that you've had that you want to you know, bring into light? And I would love to talk about all of the responses I got because they're so rich and they're so, um, I mean, that you can just learn so much from them. When I was sitting down and reading all the responses and like talking to staff members, I learned so much. But I mean, there's only so much time in the capstone presentation. So I'm gonna focus on like a part of it. So majority of people said that there was a cultural awareness and sensitivity issue at Faith Academy. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention, I only um, surveyed Filipino um, members of the faith community. And I did that mostly because um, the Global Issues Project asked us to focus in on how you can personally help. And while I'd love to help all of the members of the faith community, I feel that I could, I first need to start with my own community, my own, um, my, my people, I suppose. And so, um, and because I understand it, I understand that all the, the problems that come in, especially with Filipino interaction with foreigners, because I've personally experienced that. And yeah. So yes, majority of them said that there was a cultural awareness and sensitivity issue between Filipinos and the foreigner community. But I just want to emphasize that it is was understood by every single person who answered the survey and answered the poll that it was more of a misunderstanding and communication issue rather than it was a racist one. So they all knew that people weren't acting out on um, Filipinos because of their race in particular, but because the, there was misunderstanding or miscommunication with the way that they understood Filipinos or the way that they interact with them. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to read a story that I thought was really, um, that just kind of summed up the whole thing really, really well. Um, here. A lot of the people asked to be left anonymous, so some of these quotes don't have names on them because they did want to express the issue, but they didn't want to offend anybody. Okay, so I'm going to read a story from a student who, um, yeah, replied to one of my Google form questions. Okay, here. If there's one particular time when I felt that people were being insensitive, it was when I had issues with friends over what to do in people's houses namely having foreigner friends in my home. My parents are very welcoming in general, but do go by many Filipino standards in terms of host and guest relationships. However, my friends were not really aware of the cultural aspects of how to act in their host's home in a Filipino standard. As a result, they unknowingly insulted my parents and have, ever since, a bad, had a bad reputation with them. Well, not bad, but just not good or completely favorable. And so, I mean, this is just one um, example of how the friends of this person didn't exactly know how to act. It's not that they were rude or anything. It's not that they wanted to 
outrightly disrespect her parents or her, but um, they just didn't know. And um, unfortunately, when you have problems like this, it can leave scars or it can leave lasting impressions that are negative. So this girl just talked about how her parents didn't have favorable impressions of them anymore. And I know what that's like because my parents have expressed the same thing. They're a little more open to it though because they know that you know it's a different culture and everything. But when they're at when my friends are at my house, uh, they always make sure my parents always make sure to tell me that you know to relay the rules to them and that there's a certain way that you act when you're inside my house. And I think that can be also applied to a country. I mean, when you visit a country, there are certain rules and customs that people need to be more sensitive to. Um, another one was from a staff um, member. That's all right. Um, one of the staff at um, working, one of the Filipino staff was uh, shared a story that I'm not going to quote directly, but I'm just going to sum up. He was talking about how he didn't have a real problem with like the um, foreigner teachers or like the, the other staff, but his problem was mainly his interaction with students because he felt that, um, well in Filipino culture, we also have um, names for older people like Kuya, Ate, Opo, um, yeah, right? Um, and you usually use those words when speaking to an adult and then you regard them with a certain reverence that's like, okay, I know you're older, so I'm going to speak to you in a certain way that is respectful. And it's not that the students disrespect them. It's just that they don't speak with that kind of reverence. And so the, the person who's talking to them, the Filipino staff member feels like he's being talked to at like a child's level when he should be talked to at an adult's level. And I think that can be an issue solved by, by from both ends. Um, teaching him how to be more open-minded and teaching them how to be more respectful. So I mean, it's not a black or white thing. It's not that one group should fix this and another group should just stay back. No, it's like you have to work on both sides of the situation because he knows that they're not trying to disrespect them. It's just that that's the way they do it in their country and that's exactly what he said. He goes, I know that that's the way they act in their country, but the truth of it is they're in our country, so you know they might have to change a couple of things. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really interesting. Okay, so what I can do personally, because I've been talking about all these problems of faith, but how am I gonna be able to fix them? So I thought that my number one presenting this capstone presentation would be a really good idea because it would get at least the word out to my panel members and then get the idea planted. And I've been talking to a lot of other teachers too about my issue, just because I felt it was a little tricky and it might be a little offensive and I wasn't sure if that's the way, you know, if it was a problem that was actually recognized. But every teacher that I talked to said, you know, you should go for it. People need to hear this kind of thing. So what I want to do right now is try to just get the word out and try to get people to understand that it's a relevant issue and that it needs to be um, addressed, especially within faith. Um, and I'm actually staying here for at least one year. I'm going to go to college at Ateneo de Manila University. And my brother will still be going here. And I've already talked about possible, um, the teachers have actually come up to me and asked me if I could talk, could do this talk to other staff members. And I would, I gladly agreed. And there's a lot more that I could talk about just from the survey research that I did. Um, so that's another one. Talk to more administrators, talk to more people. Uh, and uh, yeah, so what exactly would I tell them? Well, to number the number three was a hold more fellowship type events like international potluck. I said this specifically because the staff members that I talked to, they all agreed, and they I interviewed them individually, but they all the general consensus was that they wanted more fellowship type events, like not just like plays, because they said plays you can go to, sit at the CAD watch something then leave. They wanted something like International Potluck again, which had been going on for like maybe three years and then it stopped um, some, some time. And one of the staff members was specifically talking about how she was really sad that it had stopped um, becoming an event because it was one of those things that she felt like brought the community together. So that's one. Um, another thing that I didn't put up here but that was talked about among the staff was the service award. I don't really, to be honest, I'm not like too familiar with what that is because I just only talked to the staff. I didn't have time to go talk to Mr. Schwartz, which who I was told to talk to about the service award. But anyway, there was this thing called the service award, and they would um, give awards of recognition for like so many years of service 
or so to um, several of the Filipino staff members and like three of them were talking about how some of the greatest moments that they felt um, at faith in their time working there were when they had those service awards for some of the Filipino people and they just saw students going up to hugging them and saying hey you know um, I appreciate all the work that you've done here and it makes them feel really good like they're actually doing something and that they're recognized so I don't know um, I'm not saying we should like bring it back but maybe we should have more things like like that just to appreciate or recognize them I suppose so that the student body can be more aware of them and like exactly what the kind of work they do right because Sometimes, I mean, I have no idea. I mean, this is another thing. I had no idea Mrs. Austria was here for a really long time. And it was only till recently when I was working with her for NHS that I realized, man, like, she's doing an amazing job. She gets this school running, right? And so I feel like if, and I appreciate her so much more now. And I talked to her, I'm like, you know, thank you for doing everything because you are like superwoman. So I feel like people understood that more then they would be a lot more appreciative, right? And um, holding more Filipino-centered events would be great. Arts and performances, like in the CAD. I know we had a dance this year. And I only say this because I know that in ISM and Brent, they have a lot of this as well. They have a lot of um, speakers and like um, performances come in and do things. Even in my international school, Beacon, even if we were all Filipinos, like run by Filipinos, Filipino children, they always had um, cultural things come in. They had like art exhibits sometimes. They would have... Um, um, field trips to places like the Ayala Museum. I mean, the Ayala Museum is a wealth of knowledge about the Philippines that, like, like even me living here, when I went to the Ayala Museum, I was like, wow, I appreciate my country just so much more. It, yeah, I think things like that where you get um, the kids to be involved in Filipino-centered events, um, either here or outside, I think that would be really helpful for them to understand certain Filipino, aspects of Filipino culture that they can't get on, like, a day-to-day -day basis being at Faith Academy. Um, and the last one is encourage daily action. Every single staff member that I talked to said that they really love it when students just come up to them and say, hi, how are you doing? You know, what's going on with you? How's your family? Um, most of them have amazing stories to tell that I figured out when I was talking to them. Some of them I discovered out there, Ed, Miss Charity, she has an amazing story. I never got to hear it before, but when I did, I just appreciated her so much more. And one of them specifically said something that kind of was a very strong statement, but I feel um, should be heard. She, she said, um, sometimes when people walk through the office and um, students ask her for things and they just say, don't say please or thank you and just walk away. She goes, I feel like I'm furniture in an office and nobody sees me and nobody recognizes me. And she's like, but I've been working here for so many years. She goes, and I know that's not the case with everybody, which is sometimes I, I really appreciated if some of them you took the time to say, so how are you doing? Have a good morning. Have a good day. Please. Thank you. Things like that. Just like little things like that that you can do to uh, talk and, I don't know, uh, daily interactions with people, saying hi to the custodians as they walk by. One time I was in the bathroom and I was really supposed to be there for like two minutes because it was like Mrs. Morrow's class and she's not very happy when we go to the bathroom for too long. So I went there, was gonna get out, but I saw uh, Atta Shirley and I was like, hi Atta Shirley, how are you doing? And then she told me her testimony. I mean, we were there for a really long time and she just told me this amazing story. I don't know if you've heard it, but if you haven't, you should. It's amazing how God saved her life. It was like fantastic and so, um, just now, after that, that happened last year, and every time I see her, I'm just like, oh man, like God is really working in the lives of these people too. So, yeah, so that those are the things that I want to encourage here at Faith Academy. Hopefully, I'll be here again throughout the next couple of um, months to talk to some people. They really want me to do a presentation for more of the staff members. I'd be willing to do that if people would be willing to listen. So, yeah. And that was, I just want to end with like something that one of the staff members said too. She said, my prayer for the whole community is that the leadership would create ways to make bonds with Filipinos and foreigners. Yeah, so I guess that's how we can help integrate all of the different members of the Faith Academy community into one nice whole community. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Would you like to just have a seat over here so we can ask you more questions? And yes. Maybe a little more relaxed. Sure. I'm sorry, was that like, oh, that was like 30 minutes. Oops.